whom he has known so intimately, and he tells him, because I'm sure of your sincere, genuine faith, I'm reminding you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying of my hands. So our first point we see here in the text, when it comes to talking about taking a risk, we'll see why Timothy need to take that risk. But the first point we see is to remember the gift of God. Remember the gift of God. How many of us know somebody right now, right now, who is not operating at the maximum potential God has given them? We, we all know somebody. Right? Right? We all know somebody. If you've ever been to a bonfire, there's that one person in, at, at the fire who's constantly poking and, you know, throwing stuff in the fire and staring at the fire and having a conversation but not staring at you, just, just making sure that they're intently gazed on that fire. We, we all been, hopefully we've all been to something like that where we can see this illustration. And you may be thinking, what's up with this guy? What's up with that fire? So, if you have a, a fireplace or a wooden stove at home, you know where I'm about to go. You see, in order to keep the flame to keep the embers hot, you have to tend to it. You have to stir it up. You have to fan it. You have to make it hotter. You have to do something, right? You have to be active with it. You can't just, oh, well, you know, you'll get there, you know. No, it's going to die down. It's going to cool out. It's going to cool out. Paul tells Timothy, Son, you have this gift from God and you have to tend to it lest the zeal dies down and you begin to operate at minimal potential. Timothy has been called to oversee the church in this city and they didn't have it like us. We get to meet in this nice big building, right? Most likely where they were meeting at, they were scattered abroad, right? They weren't having gourmet donuts and drinking coffee. They were scattered abroad like, like we do in life groups, right? So imagine a pastor who is shepherding a flock in a city. The flock is meeting together, they're gathering, but they're in multiple different places. And sometimes somebody comes in and they're saying this and they're saying that. He has this big or huge responsibility as a leader in Ephesus. So he's shepherding a church that been, that's been infected by these false teachers coming in and polluting all the work that was put in since Paul started the church. And people, they're actually drawing away. And imagine how devastating that is to a pastor. Kind of like you put your work into something, you put so much time and effort, and look what's happening. The devastation he was experiencing. But Paul is saying, hey, son, remember the gift you were entrusted with. Remember your ordination service when I laid those hands on you to confirm that gift. Yeah, that one. You got to heat that thing up. And guess what? That goes for the lay leader. That goes for the worship praise leader. That goes for the, the connection team. That goes for the mission team. That goes for any and every Christian who is on mission and is serving. You got to heat that thing up. That gift that God has given you. You got to fan it. It's not a superpower that you can just activate when that, you know, some, some Christians, they're just waiting. Oh, God is going to activate this. I can't wait for him to act. I can't wait when he just shows me. And that's not. That's not how it is. That is not what it is. <clears throat> so many Christians, we've been entrusted, entrusted with gifts 
to serve our local bodies and we're not doing anything with them or we're not tending to them, we're not fanning the flame in them. God has given gifts to all his children to operate in his church and we have to work them. You have to do them. Paul tells Timothy exactly how to kindle the gifts in chapter 4 and verse 2. He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. The best way to combat false teaching is to keep teaching truth, defending the faith with the truth from the word of God. Here's a quote from John MacArthur that is, it's, whew, it's a tough one. Apart from ministering our gift and service of the Lord, our life on earth is worthless. Our sole purpose as Christians is to obey and serve the Lord through the gift with, with which he has uniquely blessed each of us so that the body may be built up to be built up to be effective in evangelism. That's a sobering, sobering thought. So Christian, every day you wake up, every day you get up, you gotta fan, you gotta fan the flame in that gift. You gotta know what it is first. If you're a new believer, I encourage you to come talk to the leaders and, and we can help you. And we have spiritual gift, gift tests to help you find out what God has uniquely blessed you with. But if you know what it is and you, you're just letting it, just the, the, the embers just die down. And trust me, I'm there with you. I'm not, I'm not, I'm with you. I'm preaching to myself as well. So every day you get up, it has to be 365, seven days a week. And be careful not to quench the Spirit of God, which is how we are able to accomplish anything, not quenching, but the Spirit of God. That being through the Spirit of God is how we are able to do these things. So Paul continues in verse 7, and he says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Our second point we see in the text when it comes to taking risks for God is that we must remember the resources of God. Remember the resources of God. <laughs> Paul reveals to Timothy and us the source of how we can just take those risks to live out our faith in the midst of opposing culture and rejection of the things of God. And that's why the resource of his spirit. Many Bible scholars think that Timothy wasn't a confrontational man, but more reserved, especially when it came to going up against those who had threatened the faith in Ephesus. He persisted in ministry even while experiencing some intimidation and fear. Paul saw it fitting to remind Timothy of the gift he had received from God and the very power that worked that gift in him, the Holy Spirit. So let's look at verse 7 a lot more intimately here. The power. Notice Paul said, we were given a spirit of power. God's power. We have access to God's power. It's not something we have to pray for. It's something we have to realize. And this is huge because this just ain't no ordinary power. This ain't ordinary. We are told about this power and how it was, was able to resurrect our Lord Jesus from the grave. We see in Romans 8.11... If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The spirit that lives in you is the same spirit that defeated death, that defeated the enemy, that has overcome all that sin has taken from us. He's given us so much more back. That same spirit, Christian, is in you. Now this isn't 
Uh, this isn't power like the comic books. This isn't power like that. That we can misappropriate and use in our own selfish purposes. No, it's not that. Remember, the reason you were saved in the first place was because of the will of God. The will of God. You didn't choose to be saved. So he saved you for his own purposes and will. And then he entrusts you with his spirit and gives you power. Why? Because you are still here. He saved you right from the wrath to come and left you here. But didn't leave you alone. Didn't leave you defenseless. Jesus, too, he depended on the Spirit to provide the power for the work of his ministry. We read in Luke 5, right before Jesus had healed the paralytic, it said that, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Even Jesus was subjected to the will of the Father and his purposes for his power. Jesus left us so that he could send his spirit to us. To give us the power to carry out his great commission. We read that in Luke 24, 49. Speaking to his disciples, Jesus said to them, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. Guys, we are the light of the world. We are a city on the hill. We are those going into darkness, leading others to the ultimate light. We're the little lights leading others to the ultimate light. That means that we, when we come up against injustice in the world, we have God's power to not only speak out against it, but to do something about it. We have the power to stand for truth and justice and holiness. To pray for healing for those who are hurting, who are sick and ill. When it comes to taking risks for God as it relates to his power, we must remember that God is going to accomplish all that he will accomplish through you. And he's not going to use your strength. He's not going to use your might. He's not going to use your power. His and only his can accomplish his will. Let that be a praise God moment in your life. Yield and obey him and watch him do what he what you can't even imagine him doing in your life. Yield and obey and watch him do it. I promise I'm not charismatic. <laughs> but I'm, are you excited? Are you excited about the word of God? I promise. Paul says. God has given us the spirit of power, then he mentions love. <coughs> Pardon me, love. Paul told the church in Rome this in Romans 5. He says in verse 5, And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is love. This is love. That we learned some months ago, we talked about this when we had small groups and we were talking about this, the fruits of the Spirit, right? And we were talking about this, this particular love that comes only from God. And it's deep, right? And it's high, and it's wide. That love comes through His Spirit. It's wide and long and high and deep. And it's the love of Christ. A love that desires and works for the interest of the object of its love. Jesus simply put it in John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends and would go on to demonstrate it by dying on the cross to save us. And he works for the interest of us. He saved us from the wrath of God. Which was all motivated for his love of the Father who loves us. 
So you can take risks for God because he has given you his spirit that is, that is concerned about the interests of others and seeing their greatest need met. And it's all motivated by his love, our love for him and them. In verse 7 of the text, Paul says, we have received the power, the spirit of power, love, and self-control. Paul says, you have a spirit of self-control. This is a life that is lived in the guidelines of godly discipline. One that is properly prioritized. Remember, if we're going to go about making it a priority to know God, to be his people, and to reflect his glory, then we must govern ourselves in the conduct that is in line with these things. If we know God, then we must act like we do, honoring him as such. If we are his people, then we must fall in suit of all who his people have been called to be. If we start to reflect his glory, we must be found in him and all in the strength and power of him. Jesus, our high priest, was always found in self-control, whether internally or externally. Nothing, not acting out of our behavior as one who does not know God, but ruled by God. And the perfect image of God the Father. For we do not have a high priest, as it says in Hebrews, who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who is in every aspect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus had self-control, self-discipline. You can take risk for God because he has given you his spirit that is able to focus and apply every part of our lives according to his will. Paul tells Timothy, because of your sincere faith, you've been given the gift of God. Flame it up. Remember you have the spirit that is filled with the power and love and self-control. And as we move on to our last verse, verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. And our final stop of the text today, Paul continues exhorting Timothy now to, 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 to do something significant. To do something that, first off, the world cannot do. The world wouldn't do. Because the world sees this foolishness. And even us, we get scared to do this very thing. Paul encourages, exhort, exhorts Timothy to share in the suffering. Share in the suffering. Now Paul knew very well what it meant to share in the suffering for the gospel. But to Paul, it was a privilege. It was an honor to do so. You see, Paul was so convinced that this was the most honorable duty of a Christian. And we know he believed this because he, he didn't complain about his persecutions. And he didn't complain about his sufferings. In his letters, in fact, he boasted about them. Just read 2 Corinthians 11. Paul was devoted to suffering for the gospel because he believed it was the power of God that allowed him to endeavor in his suffering. And he was totally omission. So there's one little thing come hit me. Oh, Jesus, I oh, don't know. I'm telling you, I, I, I get discouraged. But suffering and, and suffering for, for, for the, the gospel's sake, when you really think about what it means, the things that you will have to give up, the things that 
You hold, try to hold that connect. We're called to share in the sufferings of Christ. Paul boasted about it. Paul knew if suffering was how the kingdom of God would be proclaimed to the world, then so be it. And he encouraged his young son in the faith. Don't be ashamed. I know it's tough. I know it's hard. I know they're intimidating. I know the fear you, you may be experiencing. But you don't have to be ashamed. Come. Share in this. This is something that you would have to accept. It's not a burden to share in the sufferings of Christ. Christ suffered for us. When you think about it, right? We're just following Christ's example. So as you reflect on that, as we move on to application, Pastor Tim, he, he gave us a text last, uh, as his benediction last week. It was uh, Colossians 3, 1 through 4, and it says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Accept your share of suffering. It is your share in the testimony of Christ and of all the saints who suffer for the sake of the gospel. Don't let the threats of death, the rejection of friends, family, loved ones, society, don't let demotions, threats, status, fit. No. These are the consequences of being faithful to God. Think about that. Your suffering is the consequences of being faithful to God. 